The American football coach, Vince Lombardi, once famously said that great leaders are made, not born. And I think this quote would not be controversial for most people. I think nowadays most accept that leadership is not an innate quality, but something that can be learned over time. Leadership is a process, a reflective process, that you're not born a finished product. Now, maybe when this was said in the 60s, uh, a lot of people still clung to old world notions of leadership. I mean, after all, for millennia, people were decreed kings and queens just by their birth alone. So when discussing leadership nowadays, most people will fall on the nurture side of the argument, though it can be claimed that certain things that make a leader more charismatic, perhaps uh, good looks, is something that you can't necessarily easily learn or change about yourself. So this unit is dealing with leadership, and it is a long unit, and there are some overlap with a lot of the theories. So it's not the easiest unit because of this overlap. And I myself often do get confused with some of the theories as they have many similar terms or ideas. Before we start with the leadership unit as it's proposed in the syllabus, let's first talk about what most people would rank as good leadership skills. I love to play role-playing games such as Dungeons and Dragons. And in Dungeons and Dragons, you often have your strength of character determined by rolls of the dice. For example, you might want to put your high rolls on strength so you'll be a good fighter, or dexterity so you could be a good craftsman. But I think if someone was trying to create a character for leadership, they would probably choose intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. These tend to be the typical traits associated with leadership. And in universalist theories, now we're going into the syllabus or the beginning of the syllabus, we start with the baseline of what leadership is in old world thinking. Uh, we talk about the great man theory or the universalist theory, that people of great uh, impact are the ones who change history. Now this title may seem sexist to you, and in some textbooks they refer to it as the great person theory, but I'm not going to do that because I want to make sure it's couched in old world thinking. Okay, I'm going to use the terms that the theorists actually use. Uh, people like Thomas Carlyle or this person Woods who's referenced in some of the textbooks. All right, so in Thomas Carlyle's On Heroes, Hero Worship, and the Heroic uh, in History, the world was shaped by only a few great men. And some of these include um, Shakespeare, uh, Rousseau, who is the third picture? I'm, I'm losing my mind. Uh, Martin Luther, uh, and Muhammad, who I cannot picture here for cultural reasons. So these things are maybe obvious to most, but some of these things cannot be easily encouraged in others. And therefore, if you believe that the charisma you have is based on your naturally born attributes, then you're kind of out of luck if that wasn't rolled high for you in your life. The typical meaning of charisma is the charm that one has that can inspire others to do things. The original meaning in Greek was a divine blessing from a god or goddess. So again, that kind of reinforces the notion that maybe if it's a divine blessing, the person who is trying to be of a leadership nature cannot do much about it if he wasn't given that blessing. And so we're going to try to uh, look at theories that come later on that try to cultivate leadership rather than just say you're a leader or you're not a leader. Or maybe you're this type of leader or that type of leader. One size does not fit all. So these universalist theories, uni meaning one, is that it's one style of person regardless of what culture, what era you live in. When covering a topic like leadership, it's very easy to get lost in abstract language. And when you use a science like psychology to talk about it, it's always nice if you could have some sort of empirical data to go with the concept that is abstract, in this case, leadership. Can you actually measure leadership? There have been several attempts to do this accurately, but oftentimes measuring leadership depends on having an operationalized, consistent definition of what leadership actually is. So it is a, a challenge to make something that is um, useful, reliable, and applicable uh, to a wide audience. And one of the measurement tools that comes close, at least through time, 
is the LBDQ, the Leadership Behavior Description Questionnaire, which was created by staff at Ohio State University. And it's a multiple choice, semi-Likert uh, type or Likert scale self-assessment where the leader has to answer how many questions, I forget, um, 100 questions, that's it. And just to talk about its efficacy, it has been used in the US military uh, to gauge leadership readiness. And the questions are broken down into 12 subtopics. But don't stress yourself, there are only two topics that show any sort of variance or interest upon reflection. And those two subtopics are initiating structure and consideration. Now this is a dichotomy that we're going to see much later uh, in the unit, talking about the difference between people who are task oriented or initiating a structure oriented or consideration or human relations oriented. We're going to look later at another measurement tool called the LPC, the least preferred coworker measurement, and it's going to be a similar dichotomy. Uh, are you interested in tasks or are you interested in relationships? So because this is a long self-report, I only had my students do a few of the categories to make comparisons with. And you'll notice that some of the numbers are highlighted red, and that's to show the students that those are reversely scored. So in other words, you can't just go down um, a list here and keep ticking AAAAAAA. Uh, -A 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 -A. Sometimes the A will be the worst answer or the lowest answer rather than the highest. So to give an example of such reverse scoring, let's look at number 57 here, which is in the consideration category, I keep to myself. If you circle A for always, um, that's going to be reverse scored, whereas other items, um, the A will give the highest numeric value. In this case, it will give the lowest numeric value. Okay, so that's one tool to measure leadership. Again, created by Ohio State uh, alumni and, and professors uh, back in, I think, in the 50s or 60s. Okay, it's quite old, but it's still being used today. Let's get into the theories of leadership. Oh, one more thing. Uh, when it says behavioral view of leadership, don't confuse this with the psychological school of thought called behaviorism. It's called behavioral in our textbook, at least, because it measures behaviors. This is not about behaviorism, Skinner, operant conditioning, or any kind of conditioning or anything like that. So please don't get confused with the word behavioral. All right, let's talk about adaptive leadership as our first um, theory and practice. Um, on our syllabus, we have um, adaptive leadership as proposed by Heifetz in 1997 following the universalist and behavioral theories. And all that adaptive leadership means is that we have to be flexible and uh, almost leave our comfort zones when leading other people. To make changes on the fly based upon uh, the needs of an organization. And there are six principles outlined by Heifetz uh, in his article, which I believe was published in the uh, Harvard Business Review. And in this article entitled The Work of Leadership, he talks about the first principle being called get on the balcony. And in business jargon, this is sometimes referred to as the metaphor of the balcony and the dance floor. But in his article, he calls the dance floor the field. What do these two metaphors mean? Simply put, the balcony is where you take a long view of the organization and you assess what changes need to be made. And the field or the dance floor is where all the action is taking place and you could then return back to that field and then intervene to make appropriate changes. So simply put, get on the balcony simply means an adaptive leader needs to be reflective, take a step back and get a whole picture of the organization. Principle two is identify the adaptive change. And you need to change, uh, identify one, is change needed? And if so, what will that change look like? Now I put here a picture of some farming silos because the word silo is often used as a metaphor for how departments work in various organizations. You can see they're, they're long and narrow and isolated from one another. And highly specialized departments in an organization are sometimes called functional silos. 
where um, there's a different task being done between these different departments. But as you could tell from the architectural design of these buildings, there's not much sideways communication. Um, these people are working in isolation and they may not have like a, a big picture of the organization because they're high, so highly specialized. So one thing an adaptive leader may want to do is start thinking about making companies less compartmentalized. So that's an example of an adaptive change that he talks about in the article. Uh, principle three is to regulate the stress. Your job as a leader is to make sure you find that, that fine balance between too much stress and not enough stress in your staff. You don't want a staff that's completely chill and you don't want a staff that's so stressed that they're immobile or paralyzed with fear. And this is sort of similar to the famous uh, psychological notion of maximum stress or arousal level proposed by Yerkes Dodson. This is known as the Yerkes Dodson Law. So it's a sophisticated way of just saying simply um, make sure that your workers are not too comfortable or too uncomfortable. But it is important for people to leave their comfort zones. That's how people grow and that's how people are challenged. The next principle is to maintain disciplined action. If there is communication between employees that is sort of bad-mouthing the company or there's some sort of conflicts that are being ignored, uh, it's important that the upper management uh, openly address them rather than letting the, the wound fester and grow. Uh, if you don't address the problem and, and nip it in the bud, it's only going to snowball into a bigger problem that could become in the form of work avoidance or um, scapegoating, which is blaming colleagues for all the sins of a company. Um, not thinking in the long term, attacking individuals. So just like with personal relationships, don't let a matter go unaddressed. Otherwise, it's going to snowball into a bigger matter later on. So attack head on any sort of complaints or whinges within the company. Principle five, give the work back to the people. Another way of saying this is decentralize the decision-making process so that workers feel included and they know that their talents are viable in solving problems, that they're not just waiting for their orders from a manager. And this is going to be very similar to concepts we learn later on about democratic leadership styles. Principle six is to protect the voices of leadership from below. So in other words, those people who are openly criticizing the routines and the policies and the ethics of a company should be protected. They should not have fear of reprisal or firing. And by giving a voice to all the people, you're actually discouraging even more dangerous things later on, such as whistleblowing, which could completely derail a company. So whistleblowing being where an employee goes to an outside source to reveal all the troubles within a company. That could be a newspaper, or that could be some sort of police authority, uh, best, better business practice bureaus, things of that sort. So again, just like with maintain discipline actions, it's about uh, not only direct communication, but encouraging those people to communicate and not threatening them with a loss of their livelihood. Okay, well, adaptive leadership has six things to consider. The next model, Scholar's 3P model, only has three things to consider, so relatively easy to discuss. Remember, on a lot of your exams, you have a choice uh, sometimes of what models or theories you want to talk about unless the question specifies one of the models. So the 3P model is visually represented on the cover of James Scholar's book. And you might just look at that cover and say, well, I got everything I need to know. Maybe I don't need to buy that book after all. You've got three uh, concentric circles on the cover that are rippling out. And the three levels of leadership are, spoiler alert, the inner circle is personal, the middle circle is private, and the outer circle is public. So what does that mean? That means that most leaders need to look into the middle layer because they ignore that in favor of their public leadership and their private leadership. So public leadership may be addressing all your workers at one time. Private leadership might be more of those one-on-one -on -one relationships with your coworkers. But what about one-to-one? -one? What about you and yourself? 
So let me say that again. Public is one to all, private is one to one, personal is one to self. So what separates Scholar's book from previous works on leadership is his insistence on discussing the personal aspects of a leader. And your presence will be felt if you are in control of your personal life to a level where you have self-mastery of your routines, of your mental states. So the mental health of, of a leader is quite important, that you're living your life well. Um, and again, this is going to link into other theories that we hear about later on. Most uh, likely would be, um, what's his face? Uh, Kosner's and Posner's leadership challenge theories where you being a whole person yourself models that kind of thing for other people. How could you expect perfection from people when you yourself are not perfected? So that's his book in a nutshell. I honestly have not read it. I plan on buying it in the near future, but I'm sure I oversimplified a lot of what he's saying, but there are plenty of videos on YouTube that show Schooler summarizing and discussing some of the aspects of his three levels of leadership model. And the, the key metaphor here are ripples moving away from a person. So the other spheres of your influence, whether it be uh, private or public, will emanate from the self. Everything starts from the center, and that is yourself. There's one video in particular that I like that Schooler gives here on YouTube, where he discusses how when your personal life is settled in a way that you don't suffer any neuroses and you sort of have a whole character that does what he preaches, you will develop presence. And he believes that presence is something that is actually learnable and it is different than charisma. Uh, charisma might be one of those things that is really hard to acquire, whereas presence is different. Charisma is more of a charm and presence is more like your person is felt within a, a, a space. Um, so you don't have to be charming, you just have to have presence where your presence in a room has some sort of uh, influence or you emanate some sort of self onto others. I don't know if I'm saying this very well. He does a better job of it. Um, so please check out what he says rather than what I say. Okay, and again, there's plenty of videos here on the YouTube. All right, next theory will be contingency theory, and that's by Fiedler. And this is actually one of my favorites because it actually comes with a short assessment tool, and I like short assessment tools before we talked about the LBDQ. That's 100 items. Uh, this next assessment tool is actually quite easy to administer, and it's quite interesting the way it is presented. Um, it's called the least preferred coworker scale that he came up with. And he believed that this scale will reveal two possible traits of a leader that are along one axis, and one of those traits is task orientation, and the other trait is human relations orientation. And the way this works is you think about a person you worked with that you didn't like so much. Um, now, if you're a student and you never had a job, I would recommend maybe doing this with a teacher uh, that you didn't work away well with, or maybe a classmate. But you should think about, realistically, if this was being used in a real setting, uh, somebody you actually worked with. So it reveals to you, again, are you task-oriented or a human relations-oriented person? And I say here that the LPC is reproduced in the Black Oxford textbook. Let me just quickly warn you that that reproduction of the LPC, or the Least Preferred Coworker Scale, is not correct, and I'll talk about that in just a few moments. So what do the numbers actually mean? Well, if you want to take it yourself, do it now, otherwise I'm going to spoil what the numbers mean, and you might have socially desired answers based on what you want to be. But the LPC is not a measure of another person, but it's actually a measure of yourself and what you value in other people. Do you value more of the everyday interactions between people, uh, the empath empathetic skills, um, the camaraderie between people, or are you more interested in getting the job done? Now, there's no right answer for which leadership style is better. Uh, contingency means in some situations you might want A, and in some situations want, might want B. So it depends on what type of organization, uh, how young the organization may be, what type of people are working there, et cetera, et cetera. So don't think that task orientation is better than human relations. Again, it depends on where you're going. So if you have a number that's higher uh, or equal to 64, 
it means that you are in the human relations uh, category. If you have a number that is uh, below 57, I believe, you are in the task orientation category. What if you're in between? Well, you're straddling both sides. You, you sort of are balancing both things. So again, this is not about your least preferred coworker. It's likely that the least preferred coworker is more of a reflection on your taste than that actual worker, okay? So, you know, if you want to think about different organizations, different organizations will have different contingencies based on the needs of the organization. So for example, if you were an experienced warden in a high security prison, maybe uh, you want to be task oriented. You don't want to be um, too chummy with either the inmates or the prison guards. But maybe that's an old school way of thinking. Maybe human relations would work uh, in garnering better attitudes and better respect from the prisoners. So who's to say? I have no experience in prisons, or at least not much, but I won't tell those stories. Uh, what if you're the chief surgeon of a pediatric hospital? Maybe human relations will be important because children tend to be um, in vulnerable situations. Okay, So you might want to think about which orientation works for which situation. In short, Situational leadership simply means that one style does not fit all, and contingency leadership is a type of situational leadership. Um, but to get into more complicated uh, realms, let's talk about Hershey and Blanchard and their four styles of leadership that are adaptive, or I'm sorry, situational. Uh, there are four leadership styles. All right, There's telling people what to do, there's coaching or selling people on, on what to do or trying to get them involved, have a little bit of buy-in. There is a supporting uh, or par participating realm, and there is a delegating realm. Delegating means you've passed on responsibility and you're sort of laissez-faire uh, in your management to a certain degree. Okay, I stopped uh, the video for a moment just to make some changes because I realized that there's a wall of text here and some kind of convoluted visual guides or visual aids that were originally published in the Hershey and Blanchard article. Um, let me simplify here if I may, and I hope this is not oversimplifying, but it's similar to what others have done with this study or this theory in the past. For the telling style, you're being very high in your directiveness um, and very low in your support, your emotional support. So we could say here that it's high task orientation but low relationship building. And for selling or coaching, you know, a coach is really involved with your development and your and your emotional state and your and your comfort and all that stuff like that, being much more supportive. So it's high task, high relationship. Participating is going to be um, low task with a high relationship and delegating uh, could be low task, low relationship. What I mean by task here is not that the task requires little, but that the directive or the, the, the directiveness of the task orientation uh, will be low. Um, I hope that's not more confusing than it needs to be. Um, when do you choose your style? Can you just go with what you're comfortable with? Well, according to Hershey and Blanchard, you have to match your style with the maturity level of those you're leading. Now, when you say maturity, oftentimes we think of it in terms of our growth, but maturity could change from context to context. So in this field, in this field of leadership, when we talk about a worker's maturity, we're not talking about how precocious or how adult he is. We're talking more about uh, what his skills are in a given task. So you could have high maturity in one context and a low maturity in a different context. So um, just like we did with the styles of simplifying them with these arrows, I want to do the same thing with the maturity levels. So the maturity one level is you're unable, but you're also insecure about your abilities. So in this case, your low ability, low willingness. Maturity level two is low ability, but with high uh, willingness. So maybe you have some like college interns who are ready to go, but they don't have much skill. Uh, group three or maturity level three is high ability, but maybe low willingness. Maybe they're not too confident about what they're doing. And group four is what we always hope we're leading. Group four can make us look like amazing leaders, even if we're not. That's high ability and high willingness group. Kind of going through these fast, but you know, take some time 
with the original source material if you could find it and you know try to separate these in your mind you know again I talk sometimes about what I would do on a test if you were asked about describe what psychologists have found out about leadership styles or leadership theories I might choose the ones that I could a talk about coherently but B um, get a lot out of. So for example, if you're talking about Scholar's 3P model, maybe you're not going to get as much text as you would if you were doing these eight variables for situational leadership, but it's a lot to remember, uh, at least for me who's getting old in the brain. Okay, so let's skip to this here. Let's not play this. Okay. Uh, like I said earlier, the LPC, the Least Preferred Coworker Scale, in your textbook, um, when they talk about Fiedler's contingency management or contingency leadership is wrong. So if you want to take the real LPC, go to your friendly internet provider or website or search engine and find it yourself, or you could use the one that's reproduced over here. All right, uh, in order to keep things fresh in my head, let me just recap of what we've done so far. So, so far we've talked about universalist theory. That's like a Superman theory. There's one type of leader fit for every context. We talked about adaptive leadership by Heifetz, which means there are six principles of leadership. Do you remember those six? I remember some of them. Uh, one of them being get on the balcony, yada, yada, yada. Then we talked about Scholar's 3P model, uh, which is the P stand for private, public, and personal. And the personal will lead to a fourth P, which is presence. Then we talked about contingency theory by Fiedler, which reveals if you're task-oriented or human relations-oriented. And now we just talked about the four situational leaderships that match the four situation or the four maturity levels of your employees. Now let's talk about something called directive leadership uh, by Music and Raymond. And here we're going to learn about four um, styles or four factors in your leadership. Um, whether it's high direction or low direction or low decision-making participation or high decision-making participation. So the article on styles of leadership behavior by Music and Raymond starts off by talking about some misconceptions or, or some ideas that are popular in leadership theory that they don't necessarily agree with. So one of those misconceptions is that um, Direction is the opposite of participation. In other words, if you're a leader who is making direct requests and, and, and setting tasks, that, as that somehow is the opposite of people being involved in those tasks. There is no single relationship there. The second misconception is that decision making and execution are one and the same. They're two separate things. Okay, Decision making is step one, execution is step two. And the biggest misconception is that there is a best style of leadership, okay? As we've been talking about with the other studies, there's no one size fits all. The other theories like contingency leadership and situational leadership and adaptive leadership show us, just like with Music and Raymond, that there is no one best style. Sometimes you want to be somewhat autocratic, sometimes you want to be democratic. But there's a tendency, especially in the West, to think that democratic will always be better. Well, what if the people who are making the decision have no experience or, or, or no skill sets needed to make a decision? Uh, there's an expression that we use in English, uh, too many chefs spoil the soup. What if we have so many people involved in the decision-making process and we make so many compromises that we come up with a mess? The example I like to use is like, what would you like for dinner? She would like Mexican, I would like Chinese, uh, this guy would like um, uh, Japanese. So we wind up with uh, nacho cheese smothered over sushi um, wrapped in uh, a dumpling. All right, it's a mess. Actually, that sounds kind of delicious. Um, but you know what I'm trying to say. Sometimes too many ideas are opening up the process of decision making too far and compromising those ideas could lead to some problems. So the article is available and I recommend that you look at it because it does link a lot of the previous ideas we just discussed, including some theories that were presented in the previous unit on motivation. So for example, in the middle portion of the article where it says incentive for performance, it talks about successful leaders, uh, let me read this verbatim, successful leaders also make every effort to strengthen the connection between performance and rewards. 
that sounds very similar to VIE theory and uh, the ideas of room that we learned about in the first unit of leadership. And he does actually cite room several times, I believe, in this article. So, you know, it's all kind of coming together in one place. Uh, this first section here, consideration and concern for production, um, brings into question some of the ideas that were presented in the LBDQ and the LPC scales. So, for example, um, they don't believe there is a an exclusive relationship between task orientation and consideration of the human relations element uh, within your, your staff. So they believe that's a false dichotomy. Um, so it's a lengthy piece probably. I haven't looked at it in a while, but it might help you consolidate some of your learning from the previous ideas we've come across. All right, let's simplify a lot of this by looking at the four leadership styles with this handy dandy grid over here. There are two axes, uh, that is decision making, and there's the other axis of uh, the leadership direction in its execution, how involved the leader is in executing that um, decision. So they break down very simply into um, autocratic directive, which is um, meaning low decision making involvement from the group, and also uh, high involvement from the leader in its execution. This is sort of what we typically think of in the old days, at least, of, of leadership, okay? I make a decision and I see through it uh, to the end, okay? The completely opposite of that would be the democratic permissive on the lower right-hand side, um, where you open up the process of how we're going to do it, and then you sort of let go a little bit and let them get to that objective however they see fit. And this is useful in a situation perhaps where maybe I'm a leader who has uh, business experience, but I don't have any computer programming experience. So how they're going to create this app that we want, I'm not going to be deeply involved in that, right? Um, but maybe I know exactly what the app should do. So maybe I'm going to be autocratic permissive. I'm going to say, I want an app that does A, B, and C, and how you get to that is up to you, okay? I want it by November 1st. Um, so, again, just like with the previous theories, there's no one size fits all. I think that's the biggest takeaway from all of this stuff. We start off with universalism, and then we move into this more nuanced stuff. And I don't think many of these theories are necessarily disagreeing with each other very much. One disagreement that Music and Raymond may have with Fiedler, for example, is that there are three other dimensions of leadership to think about, which is uh, worker motivation, production, and human relations or consideration. But he doesn't put these on any sort of like either or scale, like Fiedler's least preferred coworker questionnaire did, where he talked about consideration and production uh, or task completion as being in opposite directions. It's probably a little bit more independent um, variables than that, okay? So again, um, you've come across very different leaders in your life. You could ask yourself, hey, is my teacher always telling me what assignment to do and when to do it and looking at over my shoulder every second? If that's the case, then he is an old school autocratic directive teacher. Or did my teacher give me some choice in deciding how I'm going to be tested this semester? Maybe he's a little bit more democratic uh, but he does watch me carefully, so maybe he's democratic directive. So take some time and learn these four different styles. Okay, doing some validity checking, some student work. All right, there's some student work right there. Let's skip past this. Okay, lots to skip here. All right, let's get to... The, oh, wow, there's a lot more to go. Okay, let's find meaning and application for the LMX model proposed by Dansero. Uh, Dansero is spelled incorrectly in the syllabus, in the black textbook, the purple textbook, and the blue textbook. All right, his name is spelled D-A-N-S-E-R-E-A-U, E-A-U, like the word beautiful. So uh, just keep that in mind. It's just an interesting case of how misspellings could be trickled down from source to source. Uh, Fred Dancero's LMX theory is cool in that it sounds really sophisticated. 
you have something called vertical linkage diet model that was created in 1975. And I just like saying vertical linkage diet model because it makes me sound smart. But it's not that difficult of a concept to understand. Essentially, all Vansaro is saying is that there is within an organization an in-group and an out-group. And the relationship within the in-group is more informal between the leader and the immediate in-group. And the relationship with the out-group and, and the boss is more formal. And the lines of communication that exist are as follows. And it's not a bad thing to have an in-group and an out-group, but the out-group might look to the in-group as a conduit or an envoy or an access point for the leader. So there's sort of like a trickle up to the leader way of communicating. All right, so this is changeable. This is not static. This could change from moment to moment. But how does this get formulated? Well, there's three steps in forming the vertical linkage dyad model that forms an in-group and an out-group. Dyad meaning uh, uh, two, all right, so there are two groups. There's role-taking, there's role-making, and there's the setting of a routine. So the example I give is, okay, we would like to accomplish X by next April. Okay, so we haven't established any roles yet. This is the role-taking stage. Then uh, we say, Jimmy and Sarah have experience with X, so you report to me uh, when the team, uh, with the team's progress each Friday. And then after the completion of this task, maybe Sarah is now going to oversee the next project. So maybe there's a sense of routine that Sarah will stay within the in-group and maybe they're going to meet the, the boss and Sarah over a beer. Okay, they're going to informalize their relationship. Hopefully not, not too far um, because that could be inappropriate. Okay, so the vertical linkage diet model from the 70s gets updated in the 90s and changes its name to the leader member exchange model. I guess the exchange being the exchange of communication between groups. All right, so it's just an update of the vertical diet linkage model. You could know the term vertical linkage diet model because it sounds, again, really cool. It sounds like a, like a, like a, I don't know, a robot. Um, I don't know what I'm talking about. Anyway, it looks more closely at relationships than the previous model. So, where am I going with this? There is research that supports that the LMX model has some validity. Uh, there was a meta-analysis done by someone named Erdogan, um, and they set these standards for what will be considered worthy research. So if they make sure they operationalize what a group is. So if there are at least three members within an organizational outgroup or in-group, that would be considered good enough to be within a group. Um, I don't know if I want to talk about this meta-analysis too much. Um, essentially, all I'm trying to say is that vertical linkage diet model slash LMX theory, that there are this uh, schisms within workplaces that exist that don't necessarily harm workplace harmony um, is well supported in meta-analysis. Okay. A lot to get through, so let me just go quicker. Uh, individualized leadership model is another theory by Don Soro, and this is pretty much him, rather than looking at groups, looking at each uh, follower as an individual. So this model investigates what a supervisor and subordinate gain from their relationship. So there's like a quid pro quo uh, exchange model between the leader. I get your skills and you get my recommendation and various other things that are exchanged between leaders and followers. Now, the thing about followers is they are not necessarily subordinate all the time, um, and they could sometimes even be equals with the leader, just not in their position. So when we talk about followership, um, which is the next part of the unit, we could uh, talk about what qualities make for a good follower, and believe it or not, a good follower is not always somebody who agrees with the leader. Maybe it's somebody who even is on equal footing in terms of intellect and ability with the leader. So the worst thing you could find in a follower is unquestioning agreement with the leader, someone who's like a yes man or a yes person. And the example I like to use for this is George Lucas, who made 
some of the greatest film series in history. And of course, I'm talking primarily about Star Wars. George Lucas created the original Star Wars trilogy in 1977 all the way to 1983, and it's celebrated as a cultural milestone. It just shook the foundation of science fiction. And then he tried again in the 90s and early 21st century with very lukewarm results. So as a fan of these movies, or at least of the originals, I asked myself what went wrong. And if you watch the behind the scenes footage, you could see easily what went wrong. George Lucas became too famous and the people around him were idolizing him way too much and kind of, you know, kissing, you know what, and saying yes to all of his ideas. Nobody ever challenged him. Whereas in the previous movies, he had uh, some people, including his ex-wife, say, hey, maybe this is not going to work. Maybe you should change X, Y, and Z. So this is the best example I could think of, of the danger of having followers who follow too easily. Uh, let's use the terminology that uh, Kelly uses, Robert Kelly uses, in his article in the Harvard Business Review in praise of followers. Um, there are essentially four quadrants we could place followers. We could place them in a quadrant that is high critical thinking and uh, passive, high critical thinking and active, and then the opposite for, um, or the same applies for non-critical thinking, passive and active. And the four types of followers primarily are the alienated follower, the yes person, the sheep, and the effective leader. And we talked already about the yes person. That's the person who is way too eager to please the boss. And clearly he's going to be kind of enthusiastic, so we're going to put him on the active part. But he's not really critically thinking, so he's probably in that lower right-hand quadrant. Um, so let's just go from left to right here. Uh, high critical thinking passive is the alienated follower. He has good ideas, but he's not quite willing to share them outright. He's not very active. He's sort of muttering under his breath, you know, I think, you know, this is a better idea. You know. uh, the critical thinking and active is the effective leader or the lion in this picture. Uh, the sheep is the one who will just follow you anywhere, regardless if it's off a bridge. And again, the yes person is in the lower right quadrant. So uh, this article is available, reproduced in several places on the internet, but you don't really need to read it that closely to figure out, because I think the metaphors work quite nicely. Uh, so if the leader says, let's go north, the alienated follower might say, you know, south might be better, but he's muttering under his breath. The sheep will be like, north. The uh, yes person will say, excellent idea. And the lion might say, well, South has benefits too. Okay, so there's going to be a little bit of a challenge there. When you look at your textbook, in case you're using the Oxford book, they might use different language. However, these terms don't appear in the original article. Uh, they call the um, people in the middle of this chart the pragmatists. And in the original article, those people are called the survivors. They're the ones who kind of adapt according to maybe a rotating door of leaders. They kind of stay under the radar. They, they're chameleons. They can move from one quadrant to the other. So they're sort of in the middle. So if you see the word uh, pragmatist or pragmatics in your textbook, that's referring to being in the center of that grid. Uh, and the star followers, uh, that's just another way of saying the uh, exemplary um, uh, or effective leader. Okay. All right. A uh, quick quote from Robert Kelly. Uh, he says at the bottom of the screen here, if we agree that a leader's job is to transform followers, then it must be a follower's job to provide the clay. Too much emphasis is put on the leader. What about the responsibility of those who follow them? So his work is somewhat of a competing theory with some of the more mm, fashionable leadership theories out there. He thinks we pay way too much attention to leadership. So to get, bring this to the exam, if you ever want to talk about the evaluative question, you could always, rather than talk about nature-nurture or ethnocentric bias or reductionism or all the other stuff, you could always mention how certain theorists have disagreements with one another. All right, let's move on to the last thing. Man, this is a long unit. The last one is the five behaviors of exemplary leadership brought to you by Coses and Posner. 
hope I'm saying those names correctly because they're kind of famous, but um, it's new to me because I'm not really an organizational uh, psych person. The book is called The Leadership Challenge. It is readily available. It's been available for over 30 years. It's a bestseller. It's been translated into 20 languages. I will pick it up uh, over the Christmas holiday and take a deeper look at its contents. But for now, let's just get like an overview. Um, what sets it apart is that it really has a lot of empirical data supporting it. Over 400,000 sets of data were collected uh, in the formulation of these ideas, just to see if these uh, theories have any sort of validity in testing. Um, and the data holds regardless of what decade it is, whether it's the 80s, 90s, aughts, or the current decade, uh, it seems to be consistent. Therefore, um, there's some sort of reliability to the measurements being used. Now, what is the measurement being used? It's called the LPI. Now, here's where I, as a student, would start getting a headache. We talked about the LPC at the beginning of this video, sort of, um, towards the beginning, and the LPC was the least preferred coworker. Now we have the LPI, which stands for the um, Leadership Practices Inventory. What I would do is, um, to keep this clear in my head, I might refer to it by its full name, which is the LPI 360, and I'll talk about why it's called 360 in just a moment but it's measuring um, 30 specific behaviors on a 10 point scale across five um, categories. And the categories are as follows. Modeling, inspiring, challenging, enabling, and encouraging. Okay, and there are six items in the questionnaire per um, practice. Okay, so these are the five practices and there are six questions attached to each or six items attached to each. So six times five is 30. And it's done on like a like a Likert type scale, all right? A multiple choice from one to ten. Um, now, here's what makes the, the L L LPI 360 pretty interesting: is it's not just you doing a self report, but it's people who have worked with you who are also filling it out. So, why is that important? Well, you could say there's sort of like an inter-reader reliability going on, but also you're less likely to have socially desirable answers coming from the leader himself if he knows that other people will be filling out a similar questionnaire about himself. All right, so the biggest weakness of self-reports is socially desirable answers or demand characteristics or something like that where you you put down what you want to be rather than what you are. Here, you could evaluate it as being a strong self-report because of the third party people filling out the information. So what do I mean by that? Um, well, that's exactly what I mean. Let me, let me skip this slide here. The LPI has multiple functions and multiple forms. It's used not just to measure leadership, but it's also used to help people identify areas of need and development. Now, the one where other people gauge you is called the LPI 360. Why 360? Because you're getting a 360 degree view of the leader from inside and from without. You also have an individual LPI and you also have a student version of the LPI. I'm not sure about the pricing of these things. I've never taken an LPI, but if you want to, um, you can go to the leadershipchallenge.com, I believe, and see if you could take it or if you want to start a free trial. Um, there's very individualized reporting that comes from this test. And here's an example that is provided by that website. So they use a, I think a fake person named Amanda Lopez, and they show you what a report might look like. It's several pages long. And um, you can guess which question fits with which category or which practice of exemplary leadership. So for example, if you treat people with dignity and respect, um, that fits the enabling others to act uh, practice. If you follow through on promises, that means you're modeling the way, you're doing what you want others to do, okay? So I think these five practices make sense just within their titles, um, but just to make sure, let's just go over all six of the, five of them real quick. Modeling the way, you be the change you wanna see in other people, all right? Don't be a hypocrite. If you want someone to act a certain way, then you should act that way. Inspire a shared vision, um, could you include everybody into where you want to go. 
Did they have a buy-in to the future or are they isolated from the goal? Uh, challenge the process is um, don't do things the way it's always been done just because that's the way it's always been done, but challenge the process. Um, think outside the box. I know that's a cliche. Um, if that's too much of a cliche, then think outside the cube. Uh, enable others to act, okay? Uh, provide the tools that others need to get their jobs done or remove the impediments that are in their way. And the last one, encourage the heart, is actually the biggest problem they found in their 30 years of research. Um, encouragement tends to be the weakest of most people's categories. And I'm covering up this woman's um, scores, but I believe that several of the least frequent behaviors, the lowest scores, have to do with encouragement. So that's one piece of, uh, that's one finding from the study is that encouraging, recognizing other people for their accomplishments, rewarding them with some sort of public recognition tends to be a weakness across multiple organizations. Okay, uh, one last thing, a key evaluative point about the LPI is that, like I said earlier, it identifies areas for development. And so to bring it into a psychology evaluation essay, it is not deterministic, okay? You have control over your fate. Therefore, leadership can be learned, and this fits into the nature-nurture debate. If I were to evaluate leadership on a test, nature-nurture would be my bread and butter because unlike universalism, all of these theories have been on the side of nurture, okay? Otherwise, what's the point of formulating theories if the person reading your book can't change their life? If you say you're born with it, you're stuck, good luck, loser, then, then you're not gonna sell books, all right? Be positive. All right, I'm gonna conclude this long video. All right, I hope I did well with it. I'm not an industrial psych person. I usually look at these like motivational posters that hang in people's offices and I kind of think, man, those are cliche and, the, and I kind of laugh at them. And, you know, do these words have any meaning? Just know that despite this being a theory heavy unit, some of the theories have strong empirical support. And um, if you have not shut the video off by this point, I congratulate you on staying with us. All right, have a good day.